Okay, so I'm going to talk. So I'm going to talk about escape behavior, and um, and I very much follow um, the thinking that Florian outlined uh, about the MAR levels, and we spend a lot of time thinking about choosing the behavior and which behavior to use. Uh, and we ended up choosing escape behavior for the reason that uh, I can get my head around the computation that needs to be achieved. Uh, it's detecting a threat and running away from me to, to reach safety. That's the computation, right? And our job is to go and try to find out the algorithms to, uh, by which the processes of all this computation, or the different steps of the computation are, um, are implemented, and then go down to, to, to find the mechanism. Uh, and that's really the, the driving force behind all the, the research we do. And I'm just going to spend a little bit of time introducing escape behavior uh, and highlighting a couple of points, um, aspects of the behavior, why I think it's, it's, it's an interesting and uh, while at the outset it can be a very simple behavior, it can also have interesting degrees of complexi complexity that we can use um, to advance systems in our science, I think. So, um, all most animal species escape uh, at one point or another uh, because they're, they're threats and they're prey to some predator uh, and they have evolved lots of different uh, ways of, of, do, of dealing with so. And I'm just going to highlight a few. Uh, we can start with the humble fish, uh, uh, which uh, has been extremely well studied. It will escape from uh, many things. Uh, here, uh, disturbance in water caused by a water drop, and it performs a very well understood sea start, uh, sea start turn directed to direct its body away from the threat and then run away. So it's a very reactive process uh, uh, which um, they use. Uh, the next example is a, a locust uh, um, ex, uh, from, uh, escaping from a, a looming stimulus approaching from the side, and it jumps. When, when, and it jumps, and this is again very well understood, uh, it jumps after the looming stimulus has reached a certain critical angle, uh, and they also all, always escape at the same critical angle, so they can actually compute, and this has been very well understood, can compute exactly uh, when, when the expected collision time is, and then escape at a fixed period, uh, a fixed time point before that. The next one is a kangaroo rat, uh, who's going to be attacked by a snake, and it also performs some incredible acrobatics. Oh. It's, it's very impressive. Um, and so again, so this, these three forms are extremely reactive forms. The threat is just about to hit them, and, and, and they go. Uh, the following ones start to get um, increasingly a bit more complex. This one is still halfway through. This is an egret uh, who Whoa. just escapes. So it's, it's reactive. Uh, in this case, it's perhaps a little bit more complex because the, the, the birds fly. And so he had to figure out that he had to take off and take off in a certain angle uh, with respect to, 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 the, to the tiger going. Um, now we get to fish versus other, other, other species, uh, <laughs> a, run, a running thing. Uh, so this is some, some ugly fish trying to catch, uh, trying to catch birds. Uh, and, and here, it's a little bit, so you see the difference here. The, the, the bird already um, moved away from, from, from the fish uh, at a relatively safe distance, uh, which, which requires a uh, slightly more advanced threat detec detection mechanism, which, um, which, is, which is important, right? Because, uh, you know, you don't want to be escaping from threats when they're just about to hit you. You, you want to be able to predict that threat, threats happen and, and act with, give yourself enough time to, uh, to, to escape. Um, and just about, just about makes it. So I didn't, get, I, I didn't show you the one where the fish actually gets this. Just, just, to, just to annoy you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the last two ones are, are potentially more complex. So the, the, this, this one is, is a marine iguana uh, escaping from, from snake. The key thing here, for example, is that uh, this iguana has already detected the threat that there's a snake and is actually freezing. And uh, and it makes a, illustrates the point that there is a good association between detecting a threat and actually initiating escape. There's a decision period here. Uh, and you talk about motivation here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this, this animal is extremely motivated to engage in this behavior. It required no training. <laughs> uh, and, but there's an interesting thing here, which is, uh, uh, again, so this is a much more complex form of escape than just reacting and jumping away. 
because it's actually running towards, towards uh, these rocks, which, acts as, uh, uh, which are a safe place because, because the, the snake can't actually climb up, right? So this requires an awareness of space. And, uh, and also, what at the same time, having to deal with uh, snakes coming at you, acting, escaping reactively at it while navigating this complex environment. Right. Those are newborn, right? Those are newborn. So this, this, this hatched very recently. So it's, it's, I, I, don't, I don't actually, so I have no idea how they do this, right? Because I, I don't know. I don't know how they're aware that there's this thing here, right? That they have to go to. Uh, it came out of the uh, It came, yeah. So I, it, it's, it's, a, it's incredible. Uh, and, and the second one is, is, the last one is a hare being chased by two wolves. Uh, it's kind of the same, illustrating the same point where um, the hare, it's a more complex process, right? It's an ongoing process, that, which can be solved reactively. The, the hair can react to the closest one, but also has to have some sort of global strategy to, to avoid it. And you'll see that at some point, you'll start just dodging them, right? And, and acting like, you know, like a rugby player or a torero type thing. It's like, whoa, there you go. <laughs> and, you know, at the same time, it has to, he has to navigate the environment. He has to make sure that he doesn't run through a puddle of water or something like that, right? So it's cool. So it, it's like he's having fun. <laughs> he is. I think he's just, he's just really enjoying it. It's, it's not escaping. It's just like, <laughs> it's like ooh. exactly. And eventually, it makes it right. So the so there's uh, you know this illustrates the different types of escapes, the different range of complexities that, complexities that, that you have. Uh, and and they, 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 they evolve because uh, animals uh, exist in different, uh, evolved in different uh, ecologies. You know, of course, if you live on land or on sea, you're going to evolve different uh, ways of, 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 of escaping. Uh, but also because the nature of the predators and the ways they attacked uh, shape the way you have to defend. And so there's a very interesting, and this has been very well studied, how, how uh, species that cohabit uh, develop uh, developed mechanisms and behaviors that um, are adapted to each other, right? Uh, but they all, I think, have... Sorry? The bottom left is a bad example because male lions actually never attack anything mm -hmm. other than other male lions, right? They don't hunt. I would not like to put that to test, <laughs> <laughs> personally. At least they don't hunt. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the feedback is doing. <laughs> but it looks yeah. more threatening, I think. <laughs> Good point. Uh, so, the, but, but I think uh, if you want to break down and now think about the, the, the computation, uh, uh, you can probably break down escaping something like this, right? There's a, there's a, a, the first thing you have to do is detect the threat, which is a general problem, right, of, of classifying sensory stimuli into something that is threatening or, or is not. So something that requires you to engage in a defensive action or not. Uh, then you have to, having detected the threat, you have to choose whether you're going to, what are you going to do? Are you going to initiate escape or something else? Are you going to have, to, you have to perform some form of action selection. Then you have to execute it, and you have to execute it uh, um, competently. You have to reach, you have to avoid, you have to go away from the threat and, and perhaps reach safety. And then you have to also decide when you stop. Well, uh, um, you can't run away forever because otherwise you don't do anything else. So it's also important to, to, to figure this out. And, um, and all of these steps, and, and so uh, all of these steps, the, uh, you can imagine there's, there's a, a uh, it can be a very simple backbone to do this, but all of these steps are also influenced by uh, knowledge that you have about the environment. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of how that is. And I think that th this is why I think this is interesting because you can have, uh, ah, it's not here. Uh, so I'll, I'll illustrate why, um, at how, how prior knowledge might, might affect each, each of these levels. So if you think about, uh, to make the point that escape can be a very stereotype reflexive behavior, but can also have a lot of flexibility uh, that is interesting to understand. So if you think about threat detection, for example, um, uh, species have evolved uh, um, specialized mechanisms to, to detect threats. And there's many examples. Uh, this is one, this will be uh, Lisa's favorite. Uh, um, where, um, for example, the olfactory system has a, a specialized organ, such as a vomeral nasal organ, to detect uh, chiromones or pheromones produced by other species that signal danger and, and act on them, and there are dedicated hardwired, hardwired pathways that um, 
uh, that engage defensive behavior. Uh, detectors of looming stimuli are, are also another form. There, most species have detectors of things that loom. Uh, and so these are hardwired circuits that exist, that have evolved to, to, um, to, for threat detection. Uh, however, um, we know, and there's been a lot of work showing that, in the field mostly, to showing that uh, the, what you perceive as threatening is subject to your experience. For example, if you have been exposed a lot of, time to, a lot of times to a threat but nothing bad actually happens, then the adaptive response is to stop responding and considering that as threatening. Uh, likewise, uh, if you live in an area where there's a lot of predation risks, there's a lot of predators, then your perception of what might be a threat is, is, is your alarm rate is increased, right? And so you have to adjust your classification of what's threatening depending on, 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 on your experience. Uh, and that can uh, also influence other behaviors. For example, uh, birds will engage in... Uh, so threat detection is not necessarily a passive process where you, information comes at you and you decide, right, yeah, this is bad. You, you might also want to engage in a process of active vis vigilance and, and detect threats actively, and, and that is, is informed by past experience. So, for example, birds uh, in situations of high wind or where the vegetation is very high, they will spend a lot of time in this guarding behavior, essentially looking, for, looking out for threats. Um, and, of course, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, the advantage of, of having innate mechanisms for for detecting, for implementing behaviors or detecting threat is that you don't have to experience that uh, in order to, you don't have to le learn what's bad for you um, through experience, which, because it might kill you. Uh, but you might also want to have to learn that something that you've never seen before, like this weird thing, uh, might be bad for you. And so you, you have to incorporate into your innate defensive systems forms of associative learning uh, that, that uh, hack, that form new associations and hack onto the innate defensive system to, 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 to classify other types of information as threatening or not. Um, escape initiation is also um, very flexible. So uh, you might think that at the, uh, the best thing to do, uh, again, our humble fish, uh, is to just escape as fast as possible, right? You just, there's a threat, you go as fast as possible. And, and that's certainly the case, and perhaps the best example is, again, you know, the fish. This, uh, we understand this extremely well. Uh, threatening stimuli or disturbing stimuli like uh, auditory stimuli activate mountain neurons um, that contract muscles in the contralateral side and, and perform. This is an extremely fast process, and there's giant fiber-type systems uh, um, in, many, um, in many animals. Um, but, so I'm, I'm going to disagree a little bit. So you're talking about that when you see a threat, you should always go and not perform an integration. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case, always, uh, because uh, it, it, there's actually a lot of research, field research done, uh, done in the last 40 years, showing that, making the point that threat detection does not equal escape initiation, right? Uh, because there might be reasons why you don't want to do that. One is, for example, uh, optimal timing. There might be a time, there are many cases where you want to wait until for example, the predator is in some position where you can then undercut it, for example. Um, and there's other examples. Another one, and a very important one, is that uh, escape and defensive behaviors come uh, at, there's an economic trade-off. When you're escaping, you're not doing, you're not eating, you're not chasing for mates, and you're leaving your, 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 your patch uh, that y where you were in, presumably because there were some useful resources. So there, there is, and uh, there is constantly a, a trade-off between what you're going to lose by escaping and what you have to gain by, 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 by preventing harm. Um, and there's a very famous model uh, that says that, uh, it's very basic, that <laughs> when the costs of escaping, when the costs of staying outweigh the, the cost of escaping is, is when you should go. And things like uh, hunger, for example, and the presence of food or um, the presence of mates where you're um, in, uh, or when um, animals are in, in heat, uh, severely modulates uh, the choice to escape or not, and the probability of, of escaping in the face of threat decreases very significantly. So you can distinguish between just changing a threshold or the need to integrate. I mean, what you are, most of the examples that you uh, alluded to is just something where you can just say the threshold for eliciting an es escape is important. That's right. So, so, so um, but that doesn't have to. Um, um, 
it would, would still mean my, uh, my original statement that once the threshold is reached, you should just escape. Once the threshold is? For any, any of these. Sure. I mean, the, the first one is, is the interesting one, where we have actually two different behaviors, freezing or running, and switching between the two, I think, is that's where maybe integration um, might become important. I mean, I, I agree with you, you generally might. speaking. I think um, 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 I take back what I said previously. I think for also for um, um, escapes, integration is relevant. But I'm just saying that um, most of the examples you've, you've mentioned, it's just saying um, the threshold is important. Sure. Uh, well, you, you could, you know, you, you can implement, you can, you can implement a, a delay in, 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 in escaping in by changing the threshold, yeah. by by also changing the integrator sure, and yeah, making yeah, the integrator yeah, more yeah. leaky, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so uh, it, it, correct. It makes no statement about how 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 you implement well, that. It makes no statement what the need for integration. The need that is necessary to integrate. Yeah, but for the examples but where you're not integrating, like with hunger, I mean, where you're, you're, you're changing the threshold, mm -hmm. you're integrating something else, like you, hunger or maze or these other signals that, or that are that determines out. the threshold. That, yeah, that's yeah, it. Okay, so yeah. there will still be integration, but for it's the for, threshold for the threshold. For the threshold, yeah. yeah but, but not for the signal processing. I think where Tiago wants to go is that also the detection of the, the sort of decision to engage or not depends on the integration. Just Presumably so, so the, the locust, uh, the locust example, it's in the sense that it's detecting motion over time. Yeah, not not necessarily. It could it could be it kind of it could be just it, it is right. It's detecting, but I guess Florian's point would be that it's there's no there's no memory after that, right? Uh, it's there's there's not an integrate like you just you just hit something and um, no. If you did the experiment, well, if you did the experiment that Florian, the chase experiment, right, where you prevent you you. You have a, a looming stimulus that doesn't quite make it to threshold, and then you chase it. The probability would be exactly the same. You wouldn't see you wouldn't see this this decay, right? Because there was no, there was no memory of that, right? It's just saying it's a kind of a delta thing, like you just go or not. Um, but I'm saying, but 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 if you did the experiment, for example, of um, with looming stimuli, where they don't, you know, where the contrast is lower, or there's 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 there's, there's, there's noise in, in the system, right? You might want there you might reveal some integration. I mean, you can uh, test it easily. Any of these questions you can test experimentally by trying to prime the system <coughs> with a sub threshold stimulus, yeah. and after priming, ask um, is the delay now short or not? And uh, if it's an integrator, it should be, and if it's not integrating, it should be. Correct. I think that's the rest way. In low yeah, I mean the, yeah. the intensity of the threat is perceived yeah, but you by do it the individual. Sure. sure, but you do it on a ma on animal by animal basis. Right. Yeah. Right. But then you cannot come up with like one threshold. Which is no, the threshold no, should be different for each animal. Correct. But the question really is: is integration So once the situation is complete, they will engage in risk assessment, which is, I guess, integration. No, doesn't have to be. No. Doesn't have to be. But risk assessment can be hardwired by evolution that a certain stimulus, if it passes a threshold, is risky and you hope. It doesn't require a, a integration is a working memory, right? That, that, that you are accumulating evidence over time. And I think risk assessment does not necessarily mean it's, it's a useful strategy to integrate, but you don't it's have to, you don't need it necessarily. Yeah, that's right. It's a strategy for exposing yourself to you sampling the environment, right? That's what you're doing, right? And you sample the environment. Maybe, in, 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 I guess, if you think about risk assessment in, in, in rodents, which is what I know about, uh, maybe it's, it's a specialized form of sampling the environment. Uh, and it, you, might have, you, might have, um, you know, you might have already decreased the threshold or preloaded or integrated because if you, if, you're more prone to, to actually engage in a defensive B. It, if, if you think that, you know, if you're talking about defensive distance, right? And there's the, the idea that you, you, from depending on the distance, you will go from risk assessment to freezing to escape to fighting, right? Um, and if these things exist in a continuum as a face of the perceived level of threat, you might imagine that if you have integration, maybe your integrator is, you, you can imagine, you can have, you can make up your models, right? You can have a model where you have constantly integrating threat and you have thresholds for, for different behaviors, for example, right? 
uh, or you could have yeah, different integrators for all of them, the way the sensory evidence is coming to all of them. Uh, but, but it doesn't, risk assessment does not necessarily indeed imply integration. It's a form of, of sampling the environment whereby you might accumulate evidence that something but threatening is there. No, no, but there's no, this, this, this makes no, uh, no statement about, um, you don't need to accumulate evidence necessarily. You might just be sampling the environment. You, know, you just increase the frequency of sampling something that is bad, right? And just going, and if you sample more frequently, you know, you, you'll have a higher probability of detecting it, right? So you can... Um, I think the difference is whether you change your threshold at which you escape. And what is changing the threshold? That can usually requires integration of something like caloric state or prior knowledge about that if I'm in a specific environment, like in the dark woods with scratch marks on the trees, right, that that lowers my threshold for escaping with uh, And that would be evidence accumulation and the uh, mm. these things feature into that. If, if I've learned, it doesn't have to be, right? It doesn't have to be. No, just like changing the Puma threshold. P, Puma P can be uh, an innate way of um, changing the threshold in the house. It could be just something that danger to you that just lowers the, the threshold, but it could be also be learned, right? It could be acquired by information, or if it's a caloric deficit, it's probably also you're integrating caloric information. But that's one way of thinking about this. Do you need integration to change the threshold? And you can, or you cannot. But the other question is, do you also um, do integration to actually um, sense the threat serious now? Is that being integrated or is it just being sensed and compared to the threshold or not? Mm. And that, I think that that's, that's, it doesn't have to be an integration. And, um, it and certainly it's doesn't have to be. Right? Yeah. To see which animals. But there would be like two different strategies. Yeah. Depends yeah. On yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Um, and the, the last one you mentioned, so. Um, Threat does not equal escape because there's alternative actions that you might want to want to choose, right? Um, and yeah. Yes. So if I if I understand it correctly, um, so the difference between the stimulus uh, foreign and Tiago presented, one is that the coherent dots, but those dots are constant by 25% coherence. It's not changing over time. Versus in the case of those predictions, in a lot of cases. It's yeah. the sensory inputs is a changing. It's no, the, the, and, and, the, and the question is whether the sensory is sufficient to hit the threshold and then elicit the modal yeah. output or whether sure. you actually internally yeah. accumulate those evidence. Yeah. But there's a that's, that's, know, that's right. Matters, yeah. right? You could, they, you could but, put it on the same level by saying the onset of the dot motion is the onset of the threatening series. Right, but there's a point here which is uh, it's actually very tricky to compare the, the, the loom, because the statistics of the stimuli are, are constant in the, in the random yeah. loop, and the and statistics the of the loom are not. Oh, no, that's right. And that's a big problem, and that's exactly why, actually, I, I'll show you, well, yeah. if I ever get to, to do this <laughs> talk, I'll show you. I'll, we're, we're using now, we've actually stopped using cross stop, but we now, instead of using looming stimuli, we use a, a version of the Brody auditory click thing, which is innately aversive, where the statistics of the stimuli are, are, are constant. Uh, it, so, so that the rate of threat, the rate of threatening sensory information is constant, which is exactly the, to, to address this point. Because it's very hard to map the, the, the looming, the, it's a very non-linear thing, right? So it's, it's much easier, um, and that's why you can you know, solve the random dot thing analytically, because you know, it's, it's, it's constant. Right. Um, what else is flexible? The escape execution is flexible, of course, not for the fish. <laughs> fish, do, fish do this. <laughs> they go. They see something. Go. Oh. Uh, other species, however, uh, you know, we've seen examples of, of where you know, the, the hair uh, was one example that it, it, there's an advantage to have a variable, unpredictable uh, flight path. Um, then there's other things that matter. For example, um, is a lot of zebra fish don't escape to, to refuges, uh, but, but many other species do. It's been really demonstrated very well in crabs, for example, where, and there's many other species, but there's some beautiful studies from the field on crabs showing how when escaping from seagulls, uh, they, they do you know, run to a refuge and they take into consideration when they start their escape, depending on how far they are to the refuge. And here this is important, like this introduces 
uh, the need for a, a spatial awareness of where you are and an integration of that into, uh, into uh, the computation of, of escape initiation and execution. Right? And then uh, the social environment matters a lot. For example, in trolling, in schooling fish, um, their escape strategies, their escape path varies very much depending on whether they're alone or in, in, in a group. And Ian Cousins will, will I'm sure, give, show you lots of beautiful examples of, of this. So in a very long-winded way, um, escape behavior is flexible. And uh, you know, it requires integration uh, of different types of variables, sensory, things that you have learned, your, in sense, uh, your internal states, and all of these come together to produce behaviors that um, you know, can be uh, very reactive uh, to, uh, to, the, to behaviors that do need to, to integrate uh, many different variables and rely on what we probably consider a cognitive process. And because of this, uh, our strategy is to, to start at this end, try to understand the backbone and the implementation of of this and then use this to, to hack onto the more cognitive complex um, um, aspects of, of escape behavior. Yeah. Um, but even in those two pictures, when you see like in the right side when there's a cognitive thing, yeah. it's in the wild, in a very complex environment, it's a social environment, it's a habitat uh, complex environment. And the left thing, if you test one fish in a small aquarium, that's already simplified. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it's going to be a very simple response. Sure, uh, uh, of course. Uh, and maybe I can jump. I indeed. Uh, but the point is that animals, if you, if you take the behavior, the behavior can range, regardless of how you elicit it. I mean, if you take, um, you know, if you take a fish in the wild, fish in, wi in the wild will perform sea start responses, right? That, that is established. And that's still a reactive form. It doesn't have to be responding to a drop of water in a petri dish. Like, grown-up fish will, will produce this type of behavior, right? In the wild, and so So that's still a much simpler behavior than humans escaping from a fire, right? And, and that's, that's, that's my main, that's the only point, that, uh, that the behavior can range. Even in a human, if you think about the way you react to potential threats, you, you have, uh, the ability to react to something very imminent. I mean, humans react to looming things, right? If you see something unexpected coming at you, you, you react very quickly. If you're given time to, 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 uh, to, to, to process the scene, you might uh, integrate additional information that you have about, well, what's the quickest way to get out of here and should I go left or right or whatever, right? If it's a volleyball that approaches you. Or if it's a volleyball. It's completely different. No, no, sure. And so, so that, that's the only point I'm... I want to get to, to get across, right? And that by playing with uh, the environment and the threat nature and how those, th those threats are, are, you know, um, the animal arrive at the animal, that uh, that might engage different uh, processes that you can, that you can exploit. I, I would like to propose a round table discussion topic here. Namely, what's the formal definition of cognitive yeah, versus yeah, reactive? Yeah. And when does it yeah. de de deserve the label cognitive? Yeah. And um, sure. Yeah, I'm, that's um, a very And I'm happy to host that discussion, mm -hmm. and would propose maybe as a provocative statement that there is no such thing as cognition. Sure. <laughs> I I propose discussing free will. <laughs> All right. Now then, the mouse. <laughs> We work with the mouse. Mice don't eat fish. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so we use as, as uh, a threat in, in the lab, we mostly use uh, um, uh, these looming, looming spots. We use ultrasonic sweeps a lot uh, that are also innately aversive. And now, uh, I'm not going to show you that, but now we've broken this, we've shrunk this ultra, actually we've, we've taken just a little bits of the sweep, like the, the last bit, and just play play clicks and that works extremely well and now we have really good control of the statistics of the stimulus. It's just like borrowing from Carlos Brody but, but, use, but just not having to train the mice and using the... Did Carlos know that they are aggressive? Um, he, he knows by now. <laughs> yeah, but I think because initially his assay was yeah. 20 ports, right? 
the higher frequency the lower. Yeah, it, it is. They had to associate. No, no, and it still is. So I don't think so. He does, but he does it with rats, right? No, he does it with rats. I, I don't think. Yeah, I, I'm, no. I mean, in his case, they're definitely not aversive, right? Um, um, all right. So um, in the lab, we we have uh, again. So uh, trying to to recreate uh, this increasing complexity, uh, we have a variety of different arenas and scenarios that, that we create for, 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 for mice. So the simplest one is here at the top. We have a, a shelter. Uh, the mouse is wandering around. At some point, it gets loomed. And it escapes. I mean, this is a super basic, um, right? So it's very efficient. It works very well. Um, then we can have a slightly more complicated arena. So this, is, this thing is quite small. It's like this. This is like a meter and a half. It's, it's actually a barn's maze where there's a bunch of uh, holes equidistant, but only one leads to, to a shelter. So this is a bit more complicated because they can't see the shelter. Um, and so they have to, uh, in principle, memorize where they are. So uh, then we can have really big arenas or really tiny mice. Uh, where, uh, where, for example, where we can give them two shelters with different properties. Uh, we also can see when does escape break, right? Uh, if the mouse is super far away, at some point it shouldn't really escape, it should do something else. Uh, then we can put obstacles, for example, dynamic obstacles, and see how they deal with it. Uh, <laughs> it does. It's like a rally car going. Uh, and then we can make it very complicated and have, maz and have mazes where the, the, the shelter is here, and then there's an optimal path, a not so optimal path, and this changes dynamically as the mouse, as the mouse is, 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 is deciding, right? And then we see how, how they deal with it. Uh, the, this is an example of just a single escape. Um, and they, it's incredible. I mean, they, they explore this thing for five minutes, and they always, with 95% uh, probability, will choose the optimal path. Right? And now we're going to use this to, to see when things change dynamically, when you take away the optimal and you have two or three other more, how is it that they deal with it? Anyway, and this is just you know, a way of using escape to hack onto the representation of these things. Now, there's no way I'm going to actually tell you how this works. Uh, we have, quantification is extremely important, so we use, uh, we're actually using Deep Lab Cut to do this, uh, which is an incredible tool. Uh, I have no idea how it works, but it works. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. So we can just uh, take, um, so it's a minimally supervised deep learning algorithm uh, that just extracts features that, that you want, and it works incredibly well. And we can then reduce the mouse into a couple of vectors that we can quantify. Um, right, now what do, what do we do with this? If, um, so I'll tell you about, um, Two stories, one about, uh, very quickly, uh, about uh, detecting stimulus. And this is going to be the mouse version of Florence talk. Uh, and then about uh, an ongoing story about the execution, the execution of, of, of behavior, <coughs> of escape behavior. And this was done, all done by Dom Evans and Vanessa, uh, with help from Yara and Ruben, who I am extremely grateful to. Uh, right. So. Uh, we've, by now, we've all, you've, you've, you've been primed to, to thresholds and integration. So if escape is very complicated, but uh, you'd imagine that uh, the simplest thing to, to, to the simplest model is uh, when threat gets too high, it crosses the threshold, you escape, right? So uh, how is it? So this is the level two. This is this is this is considering the algorithm for for the computation of escape from threat. Uh, so to probe this, the, the behavior asset that we've uh, done uh, is take the um, um, take the the looming stimulus in the simplest possible uh, uh, configuration and vary the make this vary the quality of sensory evidence uh, just by varying the contrast of the looming stimulus. And these are three three movies where the contrast is progressively lower. The stimulus comes five times. Uh, and the videos are synced on the onset of the, of the looming stimulus. And so you'll see here the differences, right? So the, the clearest difference was the, the, the reaction time, right? So there's a progression. There was, and there was also a, a, a difference in, 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 the vigor, in, the vigor, in the vigor of the response, which is exactly uh, what uh, what you see w w with the vigor of the of 
of the fish turning, turning their head. Um, and so if we do this for, for, for a bunch of mice, and we, so if we look at here, um, this is mouse, mouse speed uh, over time, uh, so, uh, grouped by contrast and sorted by reaction time. So you can see that for high contrast, they escape always on the, on the first spot very quickly. As the contrast goes down, the, re the mean reaction time goes, uh, goes longer, but also the, the variance, the, the, the variability increases a lot. And this is exactly what you'd expect from integration of, of noisy sensory evidence. And so we, uh, so we can do, uh, derive these uh, psychometric curves, a chronometric curve for reaction time, reaction time goes down, uh, as contrast goes up, probability goes up, and the vigor of the response goes, goes up as well. And this is exactly, so you've seen these plots from Florian, and it's exactly what uh, the types of plots that you see from uh, typical learned decision-making tasks, uh, right? But here we have an innate version of, of this. And voila, the drift diffusion, the diffusion to bound model. So the, our level two here, our, the way we think about it, is exactly the model that Florian was talking about, in that we consider that there, this, uh, there's uh, a leaky integrator. So this is, this is the equation representation of the drawing that Florian had. So there's, there's a time constant here that sets, uh, the, sets a time constant for, for, for the integrator. There's a threat variable t that is incremented by, by the presence of threat, scaled by contrast, uh, and, there's some, and there's some noise. Uh, and we consider that um, when this evidence hits some sort of threshold, escape is initiated. Right, so the idea here is that if the contrast is very high, uh, this is the, the threshold is hit on the first on the first loom. If contrast is low, it takes a couple of a couple of repetitions of the loom to, to hit to hit the contrast, and so the reaction time will go longer. Right, and we actually the red lines here are actually the fit of the model to to this, and we recover a time constant of around a second. We've I don't have yeah, so I don't have it here, but we've done exactly the experiment, the chase experiment, and it matches very well actually. All right, so, so this is our level two. Now we go to the implementation. Uh, and so here the implementation to, to think about is we, um, we consider first what circuits might be involved uh, using mostly a, a loss of function approach. Uh, so we consider the superior colicals and the periactal gray, mostly because uh, it's, not, it's known already that first, uh, there's a lot of literature showing that the superior colliculus is very important for processing looming stimuli, and then that the periactal gray is important for implementing defensive responses. So the colliculus has a retinotopic representation of sensory space. Uh, the medial parts of the colliculus represent the upper visual field or the upper sensory space in general. And so, um, and as you go lateral, you, you, you represent um, the lower part. Uh, and uh, so we, most of the work that we've done here is in the medial part of the colliculus because the stimuli are being presented always from, from the top. And then in the periactal gray, the periactal gray controls pretty much every behavior that you can think of. Uh, and defensive behavior, active defensive behavior uh, is predominantly controlled by the dorsal periactal gray. And so this is where we're working on. Um, right, so to, with apologies to, uh, to Florian, don't slap us. Um, we, we used an uh, optogenetic inactivation strategy where we used this tool, iClock, which is a chloride conducting channelodopsin that works uh, very well in these two regions. Uh, and we've um, um, targeted excitatory neurons here in this, in the, in this work only. Um, and so the, the experiment is just turning these neurons off uh, sometimes while we present the, the digital wing stimuli. Um, this is what it looks like. This is the periactal gray. Um, now, what we're going to see here is so inactivation of excitatory neurons in the dorsal periactal gray. Uh, consecutive trials. A light is on in these two. Light on is PG off. And and so they're all aligned to stimulus onset. All right. And so you can see two things. The Turning off the PEG prevented escape, but it also converted the, the, the response into freezing, a freezing response. So these animals are actually reacting to the stimulus. They, they apparently perceive the stimulus as threatening, but now they're, they're freezing. They went like this. Uh, so turning off the PEG seems to prevent uh, animals from initiating escape, but, uh, but, but not perturb the ability of them to detect threat. Now, when we do this in the superior colliculus, 
we the behavior is different in that they don't escape, but they immediately continue, they could just continue and resume exploration. So clearly we've perturbed the ability of these animals to, to perceive the stimulus at all, or perceive them as threatening. Can the mice perform other motor tasks when they're hitting the PSG? They can, yeah, so they, they, they can. Uh, so we've, we've actually perturbed the PSG in many different ways, uh, including chronically. Uh, and yeah, they, they do pretty well. There's no detectable differences in you know, exploration patterns, in, locum, in running speed, and things like that. The, the octogenic light on is light on when we show the so, stimulus? Sorry, say it again. The octogenic light on is on when the stimulus is shown or ah, it's, time? It's, it's, sorry, it's, it's on 500 milliseconds before the stimulus starts uh, and then off. Uh, it's then it's possible, previous slide that you showed, PAG, then the, the light on, the mouse doesn't move, it's just the whole locomotion is off. The it's not frozen. Because no, because because it only happens if you if I don't play the stimulus, the mouse. Did you try it with the stimulus? Yes, of course. Yes, yes. So, so this is so if you just shine, if you just inhibit the PAG, if you just activate uh, optogenetically, inactivate it optogenetically, the mouse continues and explores so perfectly fine. Yeah. You've also tried the ventral part of the PAG. No, we have not. Andreas might have. Is this a scalable response? I mean, could you sort of like the, 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 the curves you showed before by inhibiting certain percentages of the neurons. Do you think you might be able to, to, to modulate escape probability rather than just black and white? So we can do it the other way. It's scalable if we activate. If we inactivate, I would expect so, though we've never tried that actually. We've never, no. Uh, I, I suspect yes, because if you do it up to, if you do with channel adoption, it's completely scalable. But it would be nice to see it this way. Um, mm, no, we have not tried it. I think yes. I mean, you, actually, actually, if we look at our half failed experiments, uh, where inactivation was the expression was not so great, or uh, the the reduction in, it's definitely the case that, yeah, it co yeah it correlates with the expression. So, if the PEG is very well infected, the reduction in probability is. But no, 100%. Whereas if it's not, uh, it, 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 it's not I so clear cut. The difficulty is that these circuits are implemented both in what you sort of describe as, as stimulus detection and uh, mm. contrast detection and so on, but also in the, in the sheer execution of the behavior. So, uh, so you're not that quite sure what you need to do. What's happening to you? So, yeah, so <laughs> it's tricky. So. It's, so if you look at the, uh, the relationship between activity in the PSG and the execution, the vigor of the response, there's a super clear correlation of the calcium signals in the PSG and the vigor of the response, not so much for the SC. And this is also true with optogenetics. It's, it's uh, in increasing the frequency or intensity of stimulation in optogenetics causes a, a really perfect linear increase uh, of escape vigor in the PAG, not so much in the SC. So the PAG is definitely much closer to, which, which makes sense, right? And the SC, it's kind of noisier and you know, it's being thresholded by, by, by the PAG and that's why that, that noise kind of goes away. That's how I see it, see it. yeah. Sorry, VIGLU2 cells, VIGLU2 cells, excitatory neurons. So it's a Cree line. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this, so we inject an AEV, floxed with whatever, uh, and so we we've estimated that uh, we so it's not 100% of the cells. Uh, it's by something like whatever 80% of the cells or something like that, or, or under that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean the PG, you know, the, the PG is very long as well. So we, uh, so yeah, it's. 80% of, of, of 100 defined by 20% by of the PG. So the inhibitor channel adoption you're using is? Uh, it's this, this is an eye clock, uh, which is developed by Simon Wiegert. Um, we, I can, we've tried every single channel, inhibitor channel adoption that there is to try in the PG. This was the only one that really worked consistently. There's a couple of new ones now that we haven't tried. Uh, 
this one works extremely well. I don't have the slide here, but so basically it creates a massive shunt. So we've done the electrophysiology and it's chloride conducting, but the reason why it works so well is just shunts the hell out of these neurons because they have a very high input resistance and a bunch of, uh, it just works incredibly well. Input resistance goes down by like 80%. Yeah, I just want so. to know if in the axon terminals that's a we don't use it in the axon terminals. Uh, I, th I, think, I think there will be a problem. Yeah, I think we'll suffer from the same problems as the other ones. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm, actually, I'm pretty sure you will. Yeah. Yeah. You don't put it on axon terminals, but anyway, within the circuit of what you are using, within the circuit of, say, PAG. We'll, no, so we, do, we don't use it specifically to, to uh, if we would, you know, in experiments where we want to just inhibit axon terminals. We don't use these two. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. In here, we're inhibiting everything, sure. Uh, and yeah, you might you might think that clearly the gaining effect, the the winning effect is inhibition. If we had excitation, yeah. you'd, you'd see it, right? That's right. Uh, how much would the picture change uh, depending on the nature of the stimulus? So if you would not using a linear stimulus, but the ultrasonic. Like an auditory stimulus or even olfactory, so would you see more variability or? So no, so everything is exactly the same for uh, ultrasonic, ultrasonic okay. stimulus. Olfaction is very different, right? Uh, olfactory does, uh, Lisa will know better than me, but uh, um, um, odors don't necessarily signal immediate imminent threat, right? And I think the pathway is actually very, very, very different. Uh, and, and the behavior is certainly very different, right? Because, you know, one thing is something coming at you. The other thing is you've sniffed something. There might have been a predator there. There might be one in the vicinity. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to get the hell out of there immediately, right? And I think that is different. Yeah. And, sorry, how much? Because when you uh, inactivate the uh, dose of PAG, you get this freezing behavior. Mm -hmm. So would you expect an increase in a different area of the PAG? Yes, the that would be the like case, the yes. The in the ventral lateral, I yeah. guess, that would be the, from Andres's work and others, that yeah. would be the, uh, the expectation, yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, uh, that's the idea for here, so I guess we've, we've, we've exhausted this point. Um, I'm proposing that there might be different roles here for, for the PAG and the SC, and that, uh, uh, in inactivating the SC abolishes, uh, perturbs the ability of the, of, of the animal to detect the threat or detect the stimulus in general. Uh, whereas inactivating the PAG, they react still very quickly. They react, the, the time to react, the reaction time to initiate freezing is exactly the same as the reaction time to initiate escape when we don't inactivate the PAG, uh, but, but they freeze, so we switch, uh, we switch the action. So to figure out what these neurons are actually doing during the behavior, we've done, uh, uh, so we can't, we don't have uh, a clear mouse. So we do, uh, we do green lens imaging uh, using miniscopes. So we GCAM6 expressing these two population of cells, uh, green lens imaging, and then uh, head-mounted miniature microscopes. Um, and we do this in separate animals in the SC and in the PAG. This is an example field of view. And um, these are, um, Single a single trial of these different regions of interest. Uh, and you can see that there's a bunch of them that are active. Th and these are, this is aligned to stimulus onset. The main thing to see here is when they're active, they're active before the, the, the animal actually escapes. Uh, when we do this for the periactical gray, this is different. There's also a bunch of them that are active, but they're active coincident to, to the onset of, of escape. And so, yeah. Yes, there are. We haven't mapped that extensively, but they individually they react. I guess the, I think the difference is that the, the coherent, the coherence of the population is much higher for uh, for for threatening stimulus. Yeah. Um, and so, if we look at uh, responses from different cells put together, uh, here sorted by um, reaction uh, by onset time aligned to escape, you'll see that. Uh, there's a lot of cells in the deep SC that activate prior to escape, whereas uh, activation of the PEG is kind of locked to, to, to the onset of, of escape. Um, and this is represented here again. So in the, in the SC, you have these neurons that have kind of a ramping calcium signal uh, up to the onset of the escape, whereas 
for the periactal lugway, they're very much locked to, the, to, to when the animal starts, starts escaping. And uh, if we look at the information that is carried by, by these two regions, uh, so if we take trials that this, where the stimulus was exactly the same, so a very high contrast stimulus, and we sort the, the responses by whether the animal has escaped or not, uh, uh, we, see, we can see that for the periactal gray, uh, there's absolutely no response if the animal does not escape, despite the stimulus being there, whereas if the animal escapes, there's a very strong signal. Whereas for the DPSC, uh, there's a response uh, the DSC carrier carries information about the presence of a stimulus, uh, but also the response is larger when the animal, esca when animal escapes. So if we, were if, we, if we do ideal observer analysis and try to predict whether the animal is going to escape or not, whether the animal has escaped or not by looking at this data, the, the activity in the PSG is almost a perfect classifier of whether the animal has escaped or not. Uh, the SC does pretty well, but also because activity in the SC uh, it starts before the animal escape, we can, we can predict whether the animal is going to escape or not uh, with decent accuracy um, about a second before it actually escapes. Since you are, uh, since you are inactivating 500 milliseconds before the steam onset, wouldn't that uh, mean that you have some kind of activity that is not captured in the calcium signal? Because there you're um, showing what's happening before the stimulus and it seems that it's kind of noisy, not escape, but then the dorsal pack, it seems that it's kind of locked in the scape. This is what I don't get. So it seems that you're inactivating before the stimulus, mm -hmm. and then you're messing with the, with the actual behavior. What's happening before to the dorsal pack that it's not captured yeah. the calcium signal? Uh, I'm not sure I follow. So we start inactivating here. I mean, we've played with the, the timing a lot, but in the, that data set, so we start inactivating here and then we inactivate throughout. Ah, uh, you're inactivating throughout. Yeah, so we inactivate while the stimulus. You're inactivating for 500 milliseconds. No, 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 no. We start 500 milliseconds before, but then it continues throughout the stimulus. Sorry. If we did that experiment, you're right. It shouldn't, it sh it shouldn't work. That's right. You don't need to know much about surgery to, to <laughs> say, to, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you're right, of course, you destroy, you destroy a bit of the SC. Uh, the only thing I can say is that, uh, you know, they still escape to, uh, they still escape to the loom. So there's still enough SC there, there's still is enough SC there to um, um, functioning to, Derive the PEG and and get and get response, but yes, we have destroyed. Final discussion: How big the diameter of the? Uh, the uh, I feel like five hundred. Yeah, five hundred. Okay, so it's it's a it's a limitation of the technique. It's it's um, it's what it is. Yes. And so is it I'll like? Yeah, I'll show, I'll show you that. Yeah. Right, so coming back to our algorithm. Uh, our, this, is, this is our algorithm. So our proposed implementation is that these two, these two algorithmic steps are implemented uh, in different parts of the brain. The integration in the DPSC, the thresholding, uh, and that activity in the dorsal PZ represents the result of this thresholding operation. Right? So if this is true, uh, you, can, you can predict that if you were to inject activity directly into the DPSC that you s and you're increasing the amount of activity that you're or the rate of activity that, that you're injecting, that you should produce a psychometric curve that is similar to what we get from, from sensory stimulus because you're just, you know, if you inject uh, not much activity, you're going to uh, sometimes not make the threshold or, or do, do it very late. And if you inject a lot of activity, you're going to hit the threshold very quickly with very high probability. Uh, so however, if you do it for the PEG, as long as you make this thing, these neurons fire, the animal should always escape with very long, very short latency. So to test this, we this with um, Florian's favorite tool um, in, the same, in the same neurons. Um, and here we're just doing our testing with um, different stimulation patterns. This is just showing that this kind of works. Uh, the important thing here is that they escape and 
we can do this actually in much more complicated environments and the animals escape towards the shelter. So if this is a circular arena, they, they will escape towards the shelter. They're just not running randomly. They're actually performing a, a goal direction um, escape behavior. And then we do um, our experiment, which is increasing the, the intensity of the laser um, as a proxy for in, in, increasing, uh, increasing the number of cells that we stimulate. Uh, these are traces of, of velocity, so these peaks here are escapes, and these are increasing laser intensities. And you can see that as, as we do this in the SC, uh, you get progressively more and more escapes, whereas when you do this for the PSG, you get nothing, nothing, and then escape, 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 right? And it's super stereotyped, right? Um, so we can indeed derive a nice smooth psychometric curve for the SC, whereas the PSG, you have this, it's much more all or nothing. Uh, and when we look at the, the reaction times, we have a modulation of reaction time uh, with increasing activation of, of, the, of the SC, but this is much shallower for the PG, which is exactly what you predict from, from the model. So this seems to, um, to hold this test. So the next thing is the, the connection. Uh, so we did indeed tracing. Um, so this is rabies tracing from uh, retrograde tracing, monosynaptic from start of VGLU2 cells in the um, in the, in the PEG, and so we do see, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of conversions, so there's about 11 to 1. Uh, most of the cells come from, from, the, from the deeper layers of the SC, um, and it does, there's a kind of columnar organization here where we see very little cells in the, in the lateral part of the SC, so it's mostly deep medial to, to, per, to periactive to gray. Right? So uh, the genetics was bilateral? Uh, it was bilateral for the SC, and for the PG, we get away with uh, just just one. We've we've done both, we've done two as well, but it works equally well because because it, it's uh, it's dorsal PG, so you can get decent elimination for, from just one. For the SC, most of the times I think it was two. But if you do unilateral for SC, what do you expect? It, de it depends on how much you hit, right? Because it's also medial, so you can also hit quite a lot. <coughs> so um, if you do, it, it depends on how many cells you have and how, 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 where you are in terms of the, the total, the maximum activation of the population, right? You don't expect a bias in how it, it escapes. A bias, you, you mean? How, I, I mean, go more to the left and then escape, or? No, there's definitely no control of, of uh, no, 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 okay, no. We've actually, we've done that very, yes. If that's what you're getting at, no. There's no, there's no control of laterality uh, in the PEG as much as I wish there was. There isn't. We've looked actually very carefully at this. We, by in infecting just one side of the PEG uh, or inactivating just one side of the PEG and the effect is, al is always, when there is an effect, is always the same as, as, as doing it both. So the laterality of the movement is actually implemented downstream somehow. And you think the same for supercritics? That's right. Why are you unhappy about that? Because it will make my life easier thinking about, yeah. Because <laughs> now I have no idea how it works downstream. So then I have to go to the MLR, which is just like. I have another question about the genetic experiment. So for the MSC activation, if, the, if what the DPAG is doing is um, thresholding, the, what, the, whatever's coming from the MSC, would you not expect the response to MSC activation to also be all or none? No. You're either surpassing the threshold or No, because the threshold is a synapse. So, um, so with them we looked, we looked at, the, um, at the connection between these two things, right? And that's a, that's a very good question, right? And so we find that they're connected but the, they're connected by a synapse with, with very low release probability, right? So you know about release probability. When action potential goes down an axon, most of the time nothing happens. Uh, and there's a certain probability that uh, a vesicle will actually be released. Uh, and it turns out that in these neurons, that probability of releasing neurotransmitter is very low. Uh, we've actually done some old-fashioned um, experiments uh, to, to show that, you know, that, so the failure rate is extremely low, high. This is actually very high because we're, Stimulating, this is fulfilled optogenetic stimulation, so we're stimulating all of these terminals and still uh, uh, we fail to detect the synaptic response 20% of the times. And actually, I, I won't bore you with these details, but the, 
we've shown that the release probability is indeed very low. And it's probably, we've done some EM as well, and it's probably low because they have not very many synaptic vesicles in the terminals. Um, so what this means is that when you, when you give one, well, one pulse, this is child option, uh, most of the time, this, this, the, the response is subthreshold, right? Uh, if you start activating it more and more, then you'll start getting more, 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 more action potentials. And this is, so which means that um, this is a, a perfect mechanism to, to implement a thresholding operation at the synaptic level. You have something that, you know, unless you see a lot of recurrent, repeated activity, nothing is going to go through. That's your threshold. And you start stimulating it, and then you start seeing. But, but this process is stochastic, right? Because synapses are stochastic. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you're at the maximum, you're going to have, this is, you're going to have a ton of action potentials. But if you're halfway through, sometimes you're going to get it, sometimes you're not. Right? And that's why you get a psychometric. So why does it make it a threshold? Uh, because it integrates over time, but also because it facilitates. So synapses that have a low release probability tend to grow bigger over time because of short-term facilitating. And actually, there is, uh, there is recurrent activity. There is recurrent activity in, in the net, in, um, in, um, cells in the deep SC. So cells in the deep SC are recurrently connected to each other, excitatory neurons, and if you give a pulse of activation, that creates reverberation during the net in the network, which in a slice has a time constant to decay of about half a second, which matches pretty well the behavior if you consider that's a slice. Now, I'm going to jump through this and just tell you that then what we've done was to so far, we've inactivated this or this, but we're claiming that this is important, the synapse. So then we activate, inactivated just the synapse. Uh, because of all the problems with in inhibitory optogenetics at axon terminals, we used a chemogenetic approach. Uh, so where we express HM4D interaxin, HM4D I interaxin, uh, which means that HM4D I is in, um, enriched at uh, synaptic terminals, and then we apply CNO directly onto the synapse or to a control synapse. Um, and so this is the experiment. It's complicated because we also put cyanodopsin in there. But uh, this works pretty well, this tool in this, in, in this system. So uh, when we apply CNO, uh, firing, of, uh, firing in SC neurons, which express the cyanodopsin, is not, the, sorry, the, the, um, the HM4D is not affected, and this is very important, but we wipe out uh, synaptic transmission, all right? And finally, this is what it looks like. This is a sideline control. This is inactivating the SCPG. This is activating a SC thalamus connection. <coughs> and you'll see that this one doesn't respond, and it's freezing as well as, as the PEG. So it's, it's exactly the same phenotype. So it gives us confidence that we're looking at the same thing. Um, and there's a bunch of controls. And all right, so this is our model. So it's a diffusion to bound model where we think that's the algorithm. We think the implementation involves uh, integration of, of sensory evidence by a network of recurrently connected neurons in the SC. Uh, and the thresholding operation is implemented by a synaptic connection that is weak, has a low release probability between the SC and the PEG. When that, once that gets crossed, um, the PEG goes and the escape is initiated. Do glomerulonic neurons uh, in PEG also get inputs from SC? It's a very good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think they do. So there's a, so so there's there's a lot of inhibitory neurons, local inhibitory neurons in the PG that synapse on onto the PG cells, and and they actually they are tonically active, uh, and so they're actually a very good candidates for actually helping setting the threshold uh, for, for 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 escape. And I I, can't, I don't I don't know that we know at least we know uh, whether they receive direct input from the SC or not. I think they do. I'm not sure. Question. So, what happens when animal habituates to the wrong stimulus? Behaviorally? <laughs> Behaviorally, yeah, it's obvious, but on, uh, on the level of the so, so, the only thing that we've looked at is that activity in the SC, deep layers of the SC, goes down massively. So, the habituation happens before. Uh, in terms of implementation, it happens whatever upstream, or it kill, kills it somehow. But the signal is kind of gone. So, so you expose each animal twice. So we have a baseline for each animal and then expose it twice. The In which? Four, so you know, and That's right, of course, yes. yes. So how do you know that the second exposure is not 
because we have controls where, okay. where do it and we reverse the order as well. Yeah, because the claim is that animals should only be exposed once. That's a wrong claim. Yeah. <laughs> if you take anything about this course, do, pay very attention to the behavior, learn the behavior very well and design your experiments accordingly, right? Because yeah, if you start flashing animals randomly without paying attention to their behavior and paying attention to the interstimulus intervals and how you, f how you design the order in which we do you, um, you vary contrast, you'll habituate the animal in, in two trials, right? And so we pay a lot of attention designing the stimulus and in pseudo-random sequences to make sure that the habituation doesn't happen. And we, are, <coughs> I, we can talk about this. So we then take all of the data set, compute psychometric curves for different halves for different parts of the data set, and when the psychometrics start to change, we ditch the data, mm. right? So that's very important. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Where do you think you can put the amygdala or lateral in the animals in your model? Because it's like visual input. The supercus is necessary for the visual input of this behavior, and then in PAT, you don't know what happens exactly. Then that's just a threshold. If something is passing threshold, mm -hmm. but I don't know the, the concept of fear or how it knows that. Yeah, so we've, if, for example, our papers also say SC to PBG, for example. Yeah, that, that's, I'm, I, can, I can debunk that very quickly, but the, the, amygdala, the amygdala is much more interesting. So, the, the, so we've even activated the amygdala, for example, and the psychometric curve changes to the, the right, so that you need more threatening inputs to, uh, to, to, to now uh, have the same probability of responding, which makes a lot of sense if you think about the, you know, the, the amygdala projects directly to PAG. If you imagine that it's providing whatever you want, a fear signal or something, that is setting uh, some sort of tone for, for the animal to, to respond. So how I don't know, it could be by, by setting the threshold, by adjusting the, the leaking stuff of the integrator or something, but it could more likely be setting the threshold. Uh, and indeed, there's a pathway from, from the PAG through, through LP, or from SC, to, from SC to LP, and then back to, back to, to, to amygdala. And so I think the one good way of thinking about that pathway is that whenever you're exposed to threat, you, need to, you should do at least two things. If it's imminent, you should get the hell out of there as quickly as possible, but you should also learn from it, so, right? And so you need pathways to, to implement uh, uh, an immediate action, and then you need pathways to broadcast that signal to, to the rest of the brain and say, hey, this thing happened, deal with it. And one thing that you should do is probably adjust your threshold, right? Which could go via the amygdala, and then amygdala is saying, okay, look, guys, we're in a situation that's not so good, you might want to be more, <laughs> escape more. So that's, that's how I think about it, for example. Yeah, so um, it, it, it's, uh, it's interesting to think whether there's a default or not. Uh, in, this in this case, so I think that the, uh, uh, my model is that um, the, if you look at, especially when the contrast is lower, uh, the animal always freezes before escape, escaping. It goes like this and then eventually goes. And I think what happens when, when, when it's stimulated at very high contrast you know, it still go a little bit and then go immediately. So what I think, one plausible model is that the threshold for freezing is lower than the threshold for escaping, right? And the, the model would be that in the ventral lateral PEG, which uh, controls freezing behavior, that receives input also from the SC and the threshold for activating those cells, uh, so those is, is, low, is lower than for activating the dorsal PEG, those inhibit the dorsal PEG ones and that's a, an established pathway. And then when the threshold goes super high, it activates the dorsal one, which inhibits the freezing. Yeah. I have kind of like a follow-up, because like when I do fear conditioning, I almost never see them trying to escape. It's like super rare. Like but isn't it called the inescapable foot shock test? You know, when I tried like unpaired conditioning, when I present them first with the tone, and then like a few minutes later, I give them the shocks, and then when I play the tone, then they try to escape. 
hmm. like crazy. They, they would not say that they cannot jump out. They totally convinced that they can. But when I do just regular air conditioning, they almost never try to escape. And even once a uh, like offset stimulus, when they have this prediction error, mm -hmm. right, they also do not try. Is it? I think Andreas should ask, uh, answer this question. I mean, so I think you had a paradigm, Andreas had a paradigm where there was uh, some conditions or some animals that escaped or not. I've never done free conditioning or electric food check, so I have no, uh, no feeling about this. Um, well, in our hands, it also depends on the intrinsic properties of, of, the, of the condition stimulus, for instance. So, depending on whether we use white noise or pure tone, there is their intrinsic you might call it saliency or, or they're probably much more relevant to, 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 to a natural situation so they're more uh, likely to induce escape responses. It, 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 it might depend on, on, on this kind of factor. But wouldn't it be smarter to try at least to escape? Like at least... No, not necessarily. It, don't only, no, no. it depends, right? I mean, if, uh, if they figure <coughs> out there's nowhere to escape. And what, you just die? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know in terms of a food shock. I mean, freezing is an adaptive response. I mean, that in, in, in the field, uh, freezing is adaptive because of two reasons. It might prevent detection, and, in, and it's an active state where you're sampling the, the environment. All right? um, so it can be adaptive on its own uh, to prevent detection. Now, preventing detection in, in when the mouse is being food shocked is, is I don't know how to think about uh, a, a threat from which they not, can, cannot escape from. So. Uh, what they should do is jump, I guess, right? And keep right. jumping at the frequency of stimulation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is what I would do if I was a mouse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at least at the end of the tone, I, I feel like you should at least try to. I, I, yes, you're right. But I guess it depends on, you know, you can, you can get into learned helplessness, right? You've just learned nothing that you do can never change your outcome and you just stay there depressed and waiting for but bad yeah. things to happen, right? But that's a model, right? Of, of my, this happens, right? Uh, mice learn that there's nothing in their control that they can do to change the outcome and therefore they just do not engage in it. The damage is not equal to that. If you live in an environment where you experience pain, yeah, that's just reducing all metabolic action might actually be beneficial. It's just whether it does. You're not waiting for death, you're waiting for it to go away. Yeah. And while you're doing that, you expend the least amount of, of, of energy. That's, people do that a lot. I mean, mm. animals, also people. I would just expect at least, like, I don't know, 10% of mice who are trying to do something. But it's all of them do the same thing. They just freeze. It's interesting. It also tells you should, you should beware always of projecting your own sentiments onto the mouse. Yeah, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's generally a mistake. No, but that, that, that's, that's a wider point there, which is which is defining what optimal behavior is onto an animal from a human standpoint, right? And that's very important. And we do this all the time, and it, we should not, right? So I think in your behavioral setup, you have a place for shelter. Correct. So from my experience with the room of object, I have two different boxes. And one of them, for some reason, always induces the tail rattling, which mm -hmm. and the woman is to go as a cattle. And if you remove the shelter, they always go into freezing. Mm -hmm. So I think also the, the behavior is that if you make a field conditioning box with kind of low walls, mm -hmm. and the tone comes, I think they will run away. So the animal, yeah. yeah. Because I, I think also the model should be integrating, and then they propose that there's a competition between escaping and For sure. freezing. Yeah. So it's not always, it depends on the environment. It's not always integrating mm -hmm. escaping. Yeah, for sure. Agree. So, um, how do animals know what is a shelter? What happens if you put several shelters? Is there some principle that they like? Yeah, I had a whole second half of the talk, <laughs> which is not going <laughs> to address that question, which is not going to happen. <laughs> uh, I can. Uh, how did it? Okay, I, I can give you in one minute. Elevate the pitch of how do you know where the shelter is? Mm -hmm. So, we do this in this barn maze. It doesn't matter. Uh, the point is, whatever you, whatever you place the threat stimulus, they always run to the shelter. So what they're trying to do um, is not run away from the stimulus. They're trying to run towards the shelter, which is very important, right? And that means that they have, so how do they get to the shelter? They can either see it 
or they can memorize where the shelter is and do that. And what they do is the second one. So we've done a bunch of experiments to show that v visual cues don't, don't really matter at all. Um, so this is for far. So th the first thing that mice do um, is, th is turn their head towards where the shelter is and then orient and go. And so this, this movement here is super important because it, it tells you that in, in this movement, for mice, for mice to perform this movement, it means that they're querying their map, the internal representation of where the shelter is, are using this to compute where they have to turn their head on, and then they just run, right? Um, and basically, the, so we can do experiments like this where uh, we have a bunch of arenas, we have flashing lights showing where the shelter is, and, the shel and we can do this also with an overground shelter. Uh, there's odors there, uh, and then we, how far? Really? Florian? Yeah? <laughs> can, can, can you solve this problem, please? Okay. All right, so all of these codes are, codes are going to rotate, and, and then the mouse goes to, so this is where the shelter is right now, and there's lights, and there's cues, and we, the, most, the, most, the most convincing experiment that I could do is, we could, I could put the shelter here, right? And the mouse, the mouse is there and runs where the shelter is, and I move the shelter here, and the mouse will run towards where the shelter was. And the shelter is right there, right? And that's like clear cut. So they don't use visual cues to figure out where it is. They use an internal, they use memory. Um, and this memory is formed very rapidly. It takes about, it takes one, a single trial, and they have to visit the shelter for five seconds, and that's it, and they know. Um, they, we've also shown that they, are, they encode, and it's, they basically encode a vector to the shelter somehow. Uh, and and that the, and the, the existence of, of um, the existence, as you were mentioning, the existence of a shelter gates, gates where the, the mouse escapes or freezes. So if we take the shelter away, the mouse freezes instead to exactly the same, the same stimulus. If, is this actually a... Um, um, and which means, which, which basically, so basically the, the only point we're making here is, um, and this is, this is I think the most interesting part of our behavior is that the, the knowledge, the, having a representation that the shelter e exists, does two things. First, it, it gates action selection. It, it gates the selection of, uh, between freezing and escape. And second, it controls the execution of escape. And it, somehow there's a representation that there is a goal and animals run towards that goal. And that's what they're actually focusing a lot on. Uh, and because the first thing that animals do when escaping is turning the, sh the head towards the goal, the, what we're focusing on is trying to understand how this head movement is, is, is going towards the goal. Um, and we're trying to look for circuits for this. The lateral SC is pro probably most likely what controls the head rotation moving in the mouse. And then we need, so we need two things to, to solve this problem. You need to know, you need a circuit for turning the head, which is the lateral SC. You need a circuit for telling where your head is. Um, in respect to the body and perhaps in respect to the rest of the environment. And for that, we're focusing on the rectal spinal cortex. Uh, Mostly the, with respect to the head, right? Yeah, correct. No yes. Knowing so where is the updating where the location of the shelter is with respect to the current position of the head, and that needs to be updated all the time. That's correct. That's right. So this is why this is a complicated problem, yeah. because it needs to be updated all the time. And so we've, we've done experiments to show that the this is retrograde tracing for, from the lateral SC to the rectal spinal cortex, and there's a bunch of uh, layer five cells uh, labeled, labeled there. We then do um, chemogenetic inactivation of the RS, uh, uh, rectal spinal cortex cells that project to the lateral SC, and then do uh, here is uh, IP, uh, CNO IP, uh, and this is what happens. So there's a sound stimulus, and then a mouse reacts, but goes the, goes the completely wrong way. Right, so the reaction time is unaffected. The the the, the turning uh, is still as brisk, but now they just turn in, in completely ran random direction. So we completely disrupt this thing, and so um, in more than half of more than half of the times they just turn and start running in a random direction. So you need you need this the input from the RSP to 
for the, to tell where the animal where to go to reach the goal. And we've done this. Was there any paper showing that lateral AC is projecting to retrospermial cortex before? There's a paper I'm not sure. I mean, if you look at uh, the Allen uh, database, there's 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 quite a quite. A, uh, we didn't invent this, so we, we got it from somewhere. Uh, yeah, I've seen some of them, but they, because you have to pass retrospermial cortex to, to use superior glucose. But no, you don't. All the tracer I don't find. Any no, you can go. You can go from the. You can't. You, from yeah, you, yeah. You, you can't. You can't go through it for sure, because otherwise, you'd be, yeah, for sure. No, you have to not go through it. Yeah. Um, and so there's a connection. There's synaptic connections. Um, most of the cells from the RSP synapse onto inhibitory neurons in the lateral SC. Um, and if we inactivate this again, if we just inactivate the synapse with local uh, infusion of CNO, we get the same phenotype. So now the mouse just runs in, in random directions. And if we do the same infusion in control projections from the RSC, for example, the singulate, the, the mouse um, <coughs> escapes properly fine. So, so we're trying to understand how, how this works. The, the model is that uh, the cells in the retrospinal input from the retrospinal cortex is inhibiting somehow the SC, leaving only the right place of the SC, the, of the right part of the SC that performs the head rotation in the right, in the right angle uh, to be activated. But we're trying to understand how that mapping ma might be. And we're doing in vivo recordings where we record, we record activity in the lateral SC and also through the, simultaneously from the RS to lateral splenial and the lateral SC. And we do this with in animals that have CNO, so we can record activity in the lateral SC and then take out information from the lateral splenial and see what is it that we lose. Uh, and we're just trying to figure this out. So basically, uh, it, there's a, we have no idea what's going on, but uh, we, can, we, can see, we can see units that uh, fire preferentially to uh, displacement. <laughs> we can see units that fire preferentially, preferentially displacements uh, uh, to the contralateral side. That makes sense. So there's, there's some, some fairly distantly tuned cells. Uh, and when we uh, take out the input from the azospinial, this tuning kind of broadens a lot and it get, becomes centered around zero. Um, which would suggest we'd be compatible with the notion that uh, if, you re if you remove the input from, from the retrospinal cortex that somehow is, is inhibiting a lot of the SC, is just leaving the right spot intact when you remove this, then uh, most neurons will fire in, will, will lose, uh, you can explain this in different ways actually, but you basically disru disrupt the, the encoding of, of saccadic type head movements in the SC, but we, there's many different models of how this works and we're just trying to figure it out. Right, we need to get on. So I've talked about escape, and uh, we're trying to get to this. And um, yeah, these are all the people who've done the work. Thank you. <laughs>